today and kind of get into the specifics of tactics on how to price and um, the story behind the company. You want to give a quick introduction of just Masterclass, and I'm hoping most folks here know Masterclass and what they do, but. Yeah, let me ask, how many of you have ever heard of Masterclass? All right, how many of you have taken a class? Okay, um, that, we, that, we, that we are going to work on. Um, so we do class, so everybody knows about us. Um, why, how, how about we just show a clip from a class? Let's do it. So. It's easy to cook on TV. There's the talent producers, there's you know, editors, and there's all sorts of things that make me look good. You know, before any TV came anywhere near my career, I mastered the craft. You'll see a side to me across this class that I don't think has ever been shown before. Nice skills. The basics are so important. Three fingers down, and this beautiful knuckle is the guiding light across that knife. Cooking salmon, so the secret is to score the skin. That stops the fish from buckling up. You can't pick up the world's best cookbook and understand you need to do it. Mm, delicious. Everything I've learned, understood, stolen, perfected, is laid bare across this masterclass. For the first time ever, you would learn how to cook those ingredients from start to finish. I've just spent the last 30 years busting my arse off to get on the plate what I'm about to show you and watch, but watch and carefully. I'm Paul Ramsey and this is my last dance. It's beautiful. So I think specific for this audience, you know, Masterclass doesn't necessarily look like a traditional marketplace, but what are the features of the company and the business that kind of look like a marketplace? Yeah, so I think for us, we have that front side of trying to get students um, fig in trying to understand what is the right price to actually get actually have them come. And we also spend a whole bunch of time trying to think if we're gonna make every single class price the same or not, right? Or do you change the price based on classes and demand? Um, and then on the flip side, it's also the it's also to get the instructors to actually teach. Um, that is a marketplace or you know a side a side of it that um, the pricing for that is usually not quite clear, and it's very hard to actually test, right? Like I can't run a fake what a, a I can't run a fake ad on Facebook and see if I'm able to sign Chef Ramsay off that fake ad, right? Um, so that that was a whole side that's actually much tougher to actually test and understand. So the way you can kind of think about it is on the demand side, you've got a traditional direct to consumer business. On the supply side, it's really the instructors and thinking about pricing or what the incentive is for exactly. that. Exactly, right? yep, yep. And so, you know, you launched your first classes about three years ago. Um, what were the things that you thought about? What were the methods that you came up with? And maybe just kind of explain to folks here what the, what the pricing you launched with was. Yeah, so we did a lot of work before launch to try to figure out what to actually price a class at. Um, and, and so it sounds like you started with the demand side first. We started, yes. Okay. So we, we started with the demand side. And so we actually did a couple of things. So I think the first stage is trying to understand what people, you know, how to price it. Is, is, is it on a per month basis, on a per class basis? Um, and before running tests, you, you have to try to figure out what are the range of actual options. So what we, so what we ended up doing was just trying to ask people. We also, tr we also try to look at comps. But then probably the most helpful thing was actually to mock stuff up. So we actually mocked up um, fake sites and went in front of folks and actually asked them what they thought about it. Um, and it was super, like, I think it was a shock to us that the price had a very big impact um, on how on how light on how, what the odds were of somebody going to buy, but it was it actually was not that if you drop the price the odds increase. It was actually if you drop below X price, people thought it felt cheap and felt that it actually was not real. So we found if it was under about sixty bucks, people thought that the site was fake. Which is like an amazing thing, also like a fantastic thing. Um, <laughs> That was per class, we actually found it. So then, but, but we saw that how people thought about pricing, at least at that time, was on a per class basis. So what we then did was just run a, bun a, whole, a, a whole bunch of tests. 
So one thing, you know, everything from pull um, with with actually polling, um, but we actually believe a lot in doing fake ads and fake sites um, uh, to try to get a, pro a actual, pro a actual like, kind of range of how interested they are. Um, and, then, and then we also did some brand work. So we actually asked at all different price points at scale, how do you feel about the brand? How do you feel it's educational? Um, do you feel it's real? Um, and there were two price points that ended up being the optimal price points for us to launch. Um, it was um, at 160 or at, or at a flat rate at, or for one class ad at, at $90. Um, and we saw both of those in the analytical work we did were actually going to produce the same outcome, at least in the short term. However, what we saw at 160 was we're going to have a significantly less amount of uh, a significantly less amount of users. So we thought, hey, we actually want to reduce the price to get almost twice as, me twice as many folks because I have faith and belief that I can get people to buy a second class. Um, so that was a bit of like how we were thinking about the pricing at least early on uh, on the consumer side. And, and how clear was the answer to you as you went through this process and what were you worried about? Because, yeah. you know, and actually going back, you know, what were the comps? Because there's really not very many clear comps for this when you think about people buying songs for 99 cents, movies for yeah. five bucks. So we actually asked people what comps were. At that time, they weren't actually trying to do comps on other MOOCs or things like that. It was more of like how much would it cost to spend a day to do a workshop or some, 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 something like that. We had some comps where they compare, compared us to getting a, a master's degree, which then I thought the price should be way higher, right, <laughs> obviously. Um, but you know, it kind of came into this, you know, um, how much would it cost to be for one thing, uh, to like one in-person live thing. I also did not want it to feel like it was entertainment. So you know, I know we talked a lot about this early on. You know, if you price it the same way that a Netflix is priced um, uh, or a song is priced, you're you're going to be thought of as entertainment, and we wanted it to be thought of as education. Um, the other thing I, I know a bunch of you probably have had to try to think about this is the actual optimal price usually is not a is not a number that is pretty. It usually like ends in dot nine nine, right? Um, or you know, it, 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 and so we actually wanted to figure out after figuring out what the statistics said was optimal prices, then where do we want from a brand perspective to be? And so we actually were looking. We actually wanted a price that we weren't able to find any other service in our area that actually had that price because we wanted to own that price. Um, and if you look, there's actually a couple brands that own price. Um, if you look at how much it costs to get a pair of, gla of glasses at Warby Parker, um, does anybody know what the price is? Yep, right. And so, like, they 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 have kind of owned that price, right? And so, we were looking from a brand perspective, what's what's the price that we can kind of own? Yeah. And so, what happened when you launched? How how did things go? Was yeah. the work that you did before launch actually accurate? Launching. Yeah, it's much harder after you launch to. I mean, after you launch, like it's sometimes it's harder to to, to test because you don't want to constantly change the price of the same person. You know, the same uh, group people are going to see. Um, I'll be honest. I remember the. I don't know if I ever told you this. The. Um, <laughs> it's happened now a long time ago. So now I feel safe to tell Rick. Um, the first day, I figured, hey, this is going to be a huge sales day because we have ton we have tons of press. This is going to be one of the best days we're going to have in years. And we launched, um, and sales were not as high as I wanted them to be. So I actually went home, this is really embarrassing, I actually went home and I actually cried. So I was like, fuck. I spent all this time to do this, got all these people involved, and we are fucked. Um, and then the next day in the office, I come to the office, I'm like, I'm gonna put on a brave face. Um, and I ran to Reed, who runs our paid mark, who, who, who at the time was running all our paid growth. Um, and he actually came from, Net, from uh, he actually ran paid social at Netflix. And I see him, I walk in the office and he is smiling. And I'm like, Reed, why are you smiling? <laughs> He's like, this is gonna be a huge business. I was like, how, wh what? 
He's like, have, have you seen the cacks I can get? Um, and then day two was just as big as day one. And then day three was just as big as day one. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, if sales stay like this and then start to increase, this is gonna be a very big business. And so then after day three, I was very excited. Um, so it was a very up and down quick emotion. And did you think about CAC before launch? Did you have a thesis around that and work backwards from that end as yeah, well? Yeah, I have a fundamental belief that up until you're very, very sure on LTV, I want to break even at least on first purchase. Um, I, I get scared at the organizations that like pay for growth um, on like a hope and a belief of LTV or on scale. Um, so for me, it had to make sure that after we paid our instructors, um, that our CAC, and then after we paid our, 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 all the marketing, we were still going to make money, at least on a per unit basis. Got it. Um, yeah. um, what were, just kind of tactically, what were some of the tools or software that, that you used to do some of this testing? Where did you find the audiences? How were you thinking about putting up these fake ads? Yeah. Um, so it's really important whenever you do stuff like that to not use your own brand, right? Um, so we actually bought ads on Facebook to just kind of run tests on it. Um, a lot of the tools I actually think are pretty weak to test pricing. We ended up to build mostly our own uh, price or our own testing tools um, for it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And is there a certain scale that you felt comfortable with um, prior to launch in testing? Yeah. I mean, for us, like the significant, like I don't, I didn't care if it was within like three percent, but like within ten yeah. percent, right? Um, so you know that was depending on the size of the gap, but. Um, that was like our, you know, for our data significance. Got it. Let's move to the supply side. Yeah. So yeah. it's fairly unique to master class in yeah. terms of how we think about supply side and what that supply side is. But um, you know, once you kind of did the testing on the demand side, how did you then translate that into conversation on the supply side? So it was a really big question. I had no fucking idea how much we had to pay a chef, a chef Ramsey, to teach a class. Um, the comps, there, there, there are comps to pay somebody like him to go do, to go be filmed. Those were comps I did not want to like, <laughs> I, 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 I could not afford those. Um, and so one of the best things we did was actually hire entertainment lawyer. Um, and how many of you have ever worked in, inside of entertainment? Wow, okay, so two, exactly. Okay, so I was like the rest of you who ha I didn't have that experience. Um, and what we learned from them was what these people actually think and care about. Um, and so for us, what, what the thing we found out is that if I'm an agent for one of these uh, folks, I also, one of the most important things to me is that the deal is fair. It's not about necessarily to optimize how much they're gonna make, but it's about that it's a fair deal. Um, and so one of the best pieces of advice we got was to stick to one deal and to not budge on it. Now that is really scary because at first you have folks that say, hey, if you can pay me twice what that is, like I'm in. And that's tempting to do, especially early on when it was so hard to get instructors. Um, and we held our guns. And what ends up by doing that is, is A, it makes the, the deal process much, much faster. It also means that any time somebody says, I want 10 million up front, you're like, sorry, everybody gets the exact same deal and it's much below that. And that's all I can do because if I change it for you, I gotta change it for everybody else. And all of a sudden, as soon as you kind of say that, everybody caves. Um, and because it's about doing a fair deal. Um, the other thing we found is that um, we, you know, share with inst with our instructors on the back on the on the back end, and most people in entertainment don't make any do not make anything on the back end, um, and so we actually decided, hey, we're going to pay much less up front and do a little bit on the back end. Um, and I remember the first time that we wrote the check to one of our instructors for for their bet for how, how much they had made on the bet on the on the bat on the back end, and their lawyer called us up and was like, "I think there's a mistake." And we're like, "What's wrong?" <laughs> He's like, "It's positive. It's supposed to be negative. I'm not supposed to earn anything yet." You're like, "No, no, no. Like the class is doing well." He's like. No, 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 guys, I've seen lots of deals like this. We aren't supposed to make anything on the back end. I was like, well, thanks for, call, thanks for the call to ask us to get back our money, but like, I, no, you actually are making money. Um, 
And that was actually a shock to them because usually like in film financing or when the films, like they take out ev every single cost, right? So that make sure that the, whoever was acting it isn't gonna make anything. And so our instructors actually make stuff on the back end. Um, and so that I think was something that was a surprise to them. Um, but it allowed us also to kind of, after the first couple went in, that let us really stand out as a, hey, this isn't gonna be like any, any other deal, which means they actually stopped to comp us against like a movie or a TV show. And what were the things outside of just kind of the monetary consideration that mattered to these instructors? And really good question. What are some of the things that surprised you? Yeah, um, I realize especially with, you know, there's all different types of people and folks you have to interact with. Um, um, but if you think about it, it's usually not just about price. There's usually other things that people care about. Um, you know, our instructors want to make sure that how they're shown is going to look good. Right? So the more influence they're able to have in that process, that is worth a tremendous amount to them. Right? Um, you know, and so I, I think there's, there's things that we found that we could kind of give um, that was to them worth a substantial amount. Um, you know, um, one thing is um, instructor, you know, it's folks like this often don't get to decide uh, what pictures are used in press. Because usually it's the film studio or something that does it. So we actually said, hey, we actually want you to look great and we actually want you to be happy with how you look. We're fine if you want to help choose what pictures we use for, you know, for press. Um, that was a give that they never ever get, right? And for us, that was like, look, I want them to be excited. When our instructors are going to devote you know, months of their lives to put a class together, um, I, I want them to be proud of it, right? And it's not just what they talk about and what they show, but it's also how they feel about the whole thing. Um, so there's stuff that was kind of aligned with both of us. How do you think about network effects on the supply side and how does that build into the pricing yeah. as well? So one big fear we had was as we got more successful and grew that we were going to have to pay more and more to, to actually the instructors because you know we now have more to actually share. Um, the opposite has happened actually. Um, I underestimated this. I think Rick was on top of this very early on, that if you create a group or a club that people want to be a part of, um, uh, it, that actually attracts more and more folks. So probably the best note I ever got was from Chef Ramsey, actually. He said, hey, David, I have a friend. I've been talking to him about the class. I really want him to teach. I've already talked to him. He wants to teach. Um, it is my friend David. And I looked. And I was like, oh gosh, so he's like third cousin, right? And like, I don't know how I'm gonna say no to his third cousin. Um, and, then, and then before I replied, uh, the, the guy replied and said, hey chef, I'm gonna move you to B, I'm gonna move you to B, I'm gonna move you to BCC. It was David Beckham. That was probably the best email I ever got in my life. Uh, Rick sends really nice emails. Jewel sends nice emails. Still, that was probably the best email I ever got. Um, and so I, I think what we, we found is that there's this really powerful effect that instructors, if you create a group um, of instructors, other instructors want to be part of it. And so early on, it was really hard to get instructors. Now, most come, in, most come to us. And so we've had the fortune of not really changing that per class pricing structure since we launched yeah. three years ago. Do you think? we got lucky or do you think we were right? It's a really good question. Um, it's worked very well and so I, 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 I think, I don't, I think it was probably some room up and down that we could be a little more efficient and optimize on it, um, but I think it was in the right, ball, the right ballpark. Right. We've now launched a subscription, so it was end of last year, that is basically the price of two classes and it's for the year. Um, Setting the price for the individual class actually really very much helped on the subscription because people were unsure how much to like in their heads now to price a class like this and all of a sudden say oh if I get one class for 90 or all classes for 180 I should do 180 but we invented that first price right <laughs> but that's now become a benchmark for it um, on the subscription um, that has taken off I think above even what we were projecting and thought. Um, um, we used a similar process for that, but we actually were able to test it in other, uh, other countries because we now have the scale. Um, we probably underpriced that a bit. Yeah. But I think, I think what's important for this group to know is, you know, the vision of the company from the very beginning was about democratization, right? Democratizing access to genius. And so that also played a part in- Huge part. 
and how we thought about price too, right? Yeah, really big part. I mean, a big, I mean, the, why we started this was to make it possible for everybody in the world to learn from the absolute best. And so we wanted to figure out pricing that actually allowed that. And that's when I talk about brand. Sorry, like that. A really big part of that is the mission. Um, at what we were seeing when we had just individual classes and not the subscription, it was, it was getting expensive to take our classes. If you wanted to take a, you know, all our classes, it's a few thousand dollars. And so we wanted to offer an option that allowed it. We did lots of price testing, and it was one of those things that's very rare where the $180 price point for access to everything was actually the one that had the best impact on, on both on the market, on the LTV. Um, and so that was one of the rare circumstances where I think, you know, it aligned with, with our core mission, right? To make classes so that it actually is affordable. That's also a really large part of our brand, and so I would never want something on our site to cost $1,000, bucks, right? And we, I remember when we were pitching other investors, you know, companies like, why don't, why don't you offer us an option that's $10,000 and you're gonna meet an instructor? Um, um, that I actually think is very bad, and one is because it's actually bad for our brand. Like, I, I don't think we want anything on the site that costs anywhere near that amount. Um, yeah, got it. Uh, so let's talk about the subscription. When you first priced, when you first launched three years ago, did you have subscription in mind? Did that idea come later? Yeah, we always had in mind, we thought we did not have enough classes or that we would need a significant amount of scale to able to do subscription. So we always thought it was gonna be you know, years out. And I know we talked a little bit about how the initial pricing affected subscription. Did that idea of subscription affect the initial price that you launched at? Oh, re yeah, very interesting question. question. Um, almost all our sales now are subscription. So I, I still want to keep that individual class price. I think one is it allows somebody who otherwise maybe can't afford the 180, they can still take the one class. We also found it, it, there's a significant amount of people buy that one class and then upgrade. Um, yeah. So time flies when you're having fun, I guess. And I, I think, uh, do we have time for questions? A actually, we're gonna open up to five minutes of Q&A. Perfect. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Trevor. Yeah. Really good question. Um, the, so the question was on the fake ads and fake sites, how far do you go? Um, so I have morals. Yeah. So um, I can't go that far down the funnel. I, where we went was probably a little bit more far than you think. So this is what we did. We had a fake site. People would click by, they'd enter in their card information, press pay, and an error would pop up and say, we aren't charging you and we gave people a free gift card to, I think it was Walmart. That's nice. Yeah, so we actually, so basically, that was expensive for us, because we're basically paying now, right, for this. Don't yeah, don't get angry at us, but you know, we try to keep it as small as possible on scale, but it was, that's the only way I felt to really get a sense if these people are really gonna pay at that, yeah. I got one, and I actually gave my cell number on the, like we put a phone number on top, but it, it, and it went to my cell. Um, to, yep, to get feedback, and also like if somebody was upset, like I wanted to explain and apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because the celebrities are used to structuring their own con contracts, does Steve Martin, you know, make more than Dead Mouse makes off it, makes more than <coughs> Gordon Ramsay, not on usage base, but on sort of how you structure the contract? No. Itself? Yeah, for the for the top talent, it's all the same deal, I mean, all the same in terms of the structure. And do you think they're Yeah, that's a really good question about why they teach. Uh, no, the first, the number one thing is they actually really, really, they actually really, really want to teach. Um, there's lots of ways for these people to earn money, right? Um, that's much less involved. Um, they absolutely have to want to teach. Um, with Dead Mouse, um, have anybody ever listened to Dead Mouse? Um, <laughs> Dead Mouse, uh, Joel is his name. Um, it, it, it is very fun. Is a very funny guy and you know quite snarky. Um, he called. He actually gave, gave 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 us a call after a couple months. His class was out and said, "Hey, the people in this class are really good. I want to sign one to my to my to my label." So he actually signed a student on, onto his onto his lit onto his record label. Um, so the the involvement of the instructors has just been incredible. Uh, if you didn't have the individual pricing for per class, do you think your subscription model would be as successful because of that? That's, That's a really good question. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I think the having the single class, um, also I think it built trust in the marketplace. Um, it let us learn a lot about what makes a great product. 
Um, it established a base of you know, really die-hard die fans. Um, and then it also acts as a comp. Um, so we've run, I mean, I, you know, we, we have run tests where we don't show a single price. Yeah. If you show a single class, it actually increases the rate of conversion of the subscription. Right. Yep. Did you, uh, Last question, did yeah. Did you anticipate the subscription model when you signed the instructor contract that you have to kind of go back and renegotiate the... These are great questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we, did we did anticipate it, um, but we also, did not, we also were aware that we weren't going to exactly know what it was going to look like. So we just, in our contract, said we have complete, we have complete control over it, over pricing. Um, you know, we definitely had a clause in there that we would make sure it was kind of true to the original kind of terms. Um, we also, even though this wasn't a contract obligation, we wanted to do right by our instructors. And so we actually called every single one of them up beforehand, explained to them, let them ask questions, and like, you know, if anybody had a big objection to it, we would have dealt with it. Um, but I mean, everybody was okay with it. Okay, we are get it, we're get it, we're starting to get the sign. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Guys.